Good morning. Um, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. I was there a second ago. I won't keep you standing for very long, but we're going to read verses 1 through 10. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he had loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Father, uh, Lord, we want to thank you for um, your holy text. Lord, I pray that you be with us in this service. Lord, we love you. Amen. I want to have a seat. So I'm Mark Souter. I'm the pastor of Set Free Church. And uh, you guys had to play All I Have is Christ, huh? <laughs> that song, man, it gets me every time. Um, Cody's brother Adam played that at my, uh, at my ordination a few years ago. Um, it's one of my favorite songs. It's, it cuts me deep. So I read that passage because um, Cody had asked me to kind of share my story a little bit and kind of share what Set Free is about. Um, and I always go to that, that passage because reality is, is I was dead. I was dead in my trespasses and sin. Like we all were, you know. Um, I came to set free back in 1999. Actually, October 17th, 1999 was the day that I came into set free for the very first time. Uh, before that, uh, it wasn't very good. I was born, you know. My my mom was 15. My dad, I think, was 16 or 17 when I was born, and I was put into a foster home and then taken out of the foster home. And all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, kind of, I'm, I'm from the West Coast, so you have to forgive me a little bit. Um, but I've been here for ten years, so I'm, I'm practically naturally here anymore. Um, I started using in the late '80s. I was born in '77, and I started using in like '88, '89. Um, drinking and um, weed and all kinds of other extracurricular activities, and it was kind of the it was the culture that I was raised in. I was raised um, around biker clubs and I was raised in the in the drug world, and so being involved very early was kind of a natural course that would come about. Um, it wasn't outside of the realm of um, my life or the people that I knew to be heavily involved in drugs and alcohol um, in their teenage and pre-teenage years. Um, we used to, uh, I had a friend that would bring alcohol to school and in uh, middle school at seventh grade was when everything really started to go crazy. Um, and in that, I was, I was very angry when I was younger. And from that, um, I started experimenting with, with like the occult things, with Satanism, with stuff like that. And I thought I was really, really evil until I grew up and realized I was just a really angry teenager. Um, I probably shouldn't really say angry. I was just a teenager. Um, and, you know, because I think uh, most teenagers are very, very angry anyways. Um, and you can tell by them scowling at me right now. It's okay. Um, 
went through all kinds of different, you know, th there's a whole world that comes when you, when you come into this life. Um, <clears throat> but I ended up trying to straighten my life out by, you know, white knuckling the strength of my, my own strength. And I uh, got married at 19 and, and I was like, well, this is going to fix my life. This is awesome. Um, <laughs> it didn't fix my life. Um, I was 19, ended up having a daughter um, when I was 21. Uh, February 23rd, 1999, um, I had uh, Samantha, my daughter. Um, she was born February 23rd. I got my first DUI March 1st. I got my second DUI March or May 1st. I got my third DUI August 10th or 17th, right around there. It's all fuzzy. Um, that year was a little fuzzy. And then um, on one of those, I was found in possession of methamphetamines. And so that brought a felony and that kind of stuff. In two of those, I had the, the um, offense in May and in August, I had my daughter in the car with me. And um, obviously, they removed me from the home. The first time, they said, hey, we understand things happen. The second time, they said, yes, you happened. Um, you need to come out. Um, that led me down to, a, to this crazy spiral, um, in and out of jail. Even, even as late as it was, they, uh, it just, that does a lot to a man when um, everything that he has, everything that he adores is gone. <clears throat> so I was in jail. I didn't have any place to go. Um, I was staying with my cousin's ex-girlfriend, and I got told to leave there because I did something stupid, which, I mean, it happens, I guess. And from there, not having any place to go, I, I packed my stuff in like a, a blanket, and I was going to walk to California. Um, I don't know why I was going to walk to California, but I got arrested about 10 minutes from the house. <laughs> My cousin's ex-wife uh, found all my clothes, like followed, yeah, you know, like like breadcrumbs down the road. Um, and then my aunt had given me a call and she said, "Hey, Mark, man, you got to do something. You got to do something. Something's got to give." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." So um, my uncle had disappeared for a while because my whole family is kind of in and out of this drug game, and my my uncle had disappeared for like six years, and he popped up and said, hey, I'm a pastor. And they're like, yeah, okay. Okay, buddy. <laughs> that's pretty funny. That's, that's pretty cool you're a pastor, but I don't, I don't buy it. And so they said, hey, you got to do something. So I, I saved up enough money. I got a bus ticket, and I went to California. Not to what I wanted to do originally, not what I was walking to do, but I ended up going to this place in the middle of the desert. It's... Um, Cabazon, California, and, and you guys shouldn't really know where it's at unless you've been out there. There's no reason. It's like a trailer park in the desert, and that, that's really about what it is. I drove through there in June, and it's way worse than it was even when I was there. Um, and I got there in the middle of the night on a Saturday night. I thought I was going to drug treatment. You know, this is a 30-day, get clean, fix your life, all that kind of stuff. And... Uh, I got there at 10.30. Uh, lights out was, was at 10, so I didn't really know what was going on. There was a trailer. They took my stuff. They put it off to the side, and they said, hey, they gave me a bunk, maybe sign up a waiver, and put me in a bunk. And, and it was crazy because the bunk, there was four bunk beds in a single wide trailer, in the, just that's the living room. And so there was about, about two inches in between each bunk bed, so you had to go in through the, through the end. And which was weird to me because I've never, I had never lived in any kind of situation like that. And then Sunday morning, which is kind of a, a crazy time, um, Sunday morning out there, they don't really do anything. But there was a guy th that was the overseer. And so I was um, drinking on the bus, of course. And so I didn't feel very good in the morning. <laughs> and this guy, um, we call him Indian Joe. I wake up to, good morning, good morning, good morning. Like, 
what in the world did I come to? And so Sundays out there was, was kind of a crazy thing because you would have breakfast and then unless you've been there for a couple weeks and you were on the church schedule, you just sat there in the desert in California all day with your thoughts. That was not a good thing for me at the time because I, wasn't, I didn't really want to do what I was doing, but I was doing it to try to make everybody happy and try to get back in the good graces of everybody that was around me. You know what I mean? And it wasn't, that very, wasn't very promising at that point. Um, I had decided that I was going to leave. Um, I, I, I told the guys, I said, man, this is crazy. If this is what this is, then I'm just going to leave. Um, they said, hold on, just wait. I said, they said, do you even know where you're at? I said, no. I said, all right, we're not going to tell you which way to go. Just wait. If you still want to leave tomorrow, we'll tell you which way to go. I said, okay, I'll give it one night. No problem. I don't know, it, I don't know where I'm at anyways. So every night at 7 o'clock, it was 6.30, 7 o'clock, I can't remember, um, they would have a praise and worship, and there was a speaker. So me being unsaved, never been to church in my life, nothing like that, there's a whole bunch of people. There's guys with tattoos on their face that say 5150. And there's, it looks like, you know, when everybody woke up, I thought I was in, in a prison yard. And I'm a young, young man and, and just not understanding anything going on. And all these guys are on this little platform and they're singing. And I had no idea what they were even doing. They were singing, they were, they were clapping, they were joyful. And I was like, this is crazy. I don't know what, these people are nuts. <laughs> I thought I was out there. These guys are way out there, though. And there was a, then there, then there was a, a, a message. Um, I remember who spoke it. It was uh, Pastor Victor Alvarado. He passed away a couple years ago. <clears throat> but he preached, I, I, I couldn't tell you what he preached. But I know it hit me. It hit me like a ton of bricks. And the Lord drew me to himself that night. Is it? It's kind of crazy that it's October 15th because in two days, it's been 24 years since that, that happened. Um, it hit me hard. At that time, it was a 30-day program. So I, I was, my plan was to do 30 days and go home. Um, and I ended up blessing out, going to one of the mother, the mother church and doing some stuff for a while. And, you know, a lot of times with, with testimonies, people, you know, Excited, oh, so you, you met the Lord and everything was good. No, no. Met the Lord and everything got worse. My whole life got worse. My hope of getting my family back, I blew that. Um, I ended up going back to set free the next year, staying for two weeks and leaving. I ended up going to a different set free. I stayed one night and then they made me go to class, and I left. Um, and it was cold. It was it was outside of Spokane, Washington, and the smoke pit was in the there was snow everywhere. And I was just like, "No, nah, I'm not going to be able to do this." And then I went back again. And it, this was back in 2001, 2002, and I was I, I was tired. I I uh, went to set free and. This, Something really happened because I saw somebody, I saw an older guy. I, I got to remember, I was 24. It doesn't really seem like he's an older guy now. That I'm, that I, but he was about 60 years old, and he had come in strung out on crack. And I looked at him. I said, man, I do not want to do this. I can't. I do not want to be coming into a program in my 60s. This is, this is crazy. So God kind of gripped my life for a time my life for a time. I, I was clean. I was sober. I was following the Lord. I was running youth ministry. I was doing all this. I, I was doing my best to seek God. And then my ex's brother died. And she started, he, he was an avid drug user. And uh, she started to go console his widow. Console his widow meant she was going to use. And eventually I had started drinking. And uh, when you drink, you lose really all inhibitions. And it wasn't long after that that I started using. 
And then 2008 was kind of a blur. Um, I don't know, but it was lost. I was lost. It was totally nuts. Um, I ended up in Colorado with nothing again. Packed up a, a Ford Explorer that I didn't ever pay for. I didn't have the title for, but I drove it till the tag wore out and uh, ended up in Colorado, and I was gonna straighten my life out. So I quit doing meth and just focused solely on drinking, and that was a great plan. <laughs> Not at all. And I remember I was in, I, I got this house, and I, I know it's, it's kind of a lot of my old story, but I kind of want to, because it, it led up to this one moment right here. Um, I remember I was, I had drank, I don't know how much, I'm, I'm not even going to say it, but I was watching a Colorado Rockies game because I love baseball, and that, so I was watching TV, and I remember uh, just like, this isn't it, this can't be it. I remember praying, um, praying, we call it praying, but I was calling God out because where I was is not where I, is where I knew I wasn't supposed to be. And I, I told God, I said, what, what is this? What am I, where am I at? What am I doing? It's a great prayer, but when you pray something like that, God starts to remove every single thing that's in the way. Uh, my wife left me. Um, it's going to start like a country song here, here pretty quick. My wife left me, so I, I met another girl, of course. And then um, we were going to change the world together. And then I went to jail. And it was supposed to be a DUI. I was supposed to stay overnight, go home, and I was going to leave town. It wasn't going to be a big deal. Well, being that I was um, high risk and I had a, had a tendency to not go to court, um, they said, you're not leaving. So they held me for two months. That was the greatest thing that God had ever done for me is put me in jail that day. Um, because of that, my head was able to clear and I was able to start going to some Bible studies and stuff. The girl that I thought I was going to change my life, I was spending my life with, she left. You know, she, she was going to wait for me and all that stuff. And that, I got a letter that she was waiting for me the next day. I got a letter, well, I'm leaving. <laughs> cool. I ended up going to jail a couple more times because, of course, I'm hard-headed and none of that happened. And then I got out of jail in, like, January of 2010. And I just started right back. And I, I posted one day on Facebook. I said, look, it was some kind of, it was song lyrics, and they were basically a cry for help. It was a suicidal kind of song kind of thing. I was done. I was... Didn't matter what happened. I I remember one night I I took a whole bunch of Dramamine because I'd heard that you take a lot enough and you just won't wake up. So I took a bottle of Dramamine and I I slept for like 16 hours and I woke up and I was so mad. I was so mad that I woke up. And I posted these song lyrics and my pastor's wife in California said, "Honey, just come home. We'll figure everything out. Just come home." And I said, no, 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 I'm, in, I'm close to Denver. I'll, I'll go to Set Free in Denver. Or I'll, I'll go talk to them. And then some random girl messaged me and said, hey, I'm in Denver. I'm like, oh, who are you? So we ended up talking a little bit. And uh, we started talking the next day. And we started talking the next day. And we started talking the next day and the next day. And then she said, well, I'm going with Wyoming. I said, well, you have fun. I said, I'm never going back to that cult again. I'm talking about Set Free. She was going to plant, start a women's home. Um, she was sick, so she asked me if I could read the Bible to her a little bit. So I read the story of Joseph. God started to stir up my heart a little bit. And then she said, well, will you read me Esther? I started reading Esther. By the, before we were done with Esther, I was going back to Set Free. Um, we ended up going to Set Free. She went to start the women's home. I went to phase one. Uh, we got married about seven months later. Um, She's wanted to come today, but she's sick. Um, she's, she's been sick the last few days. And then while we were there, about two weeks after we were there, we were at a revival at this church. And it was kind of it was kind of crazy because I, I I thought that I was called to preach, 
And then, but I was 22 years old. 22 years old, you don't really know anything. If you're not yet 22, trust me, if you're past 22, you already know. <clears throat> we were at this revival, and this guy was preaching John 21. You know, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. Well, we were sitting next to each other, and she started poking me. She said, ah, you're the cook, because I was cooking at the ministry. And I was like, that's not what he's saying. God was reiterating the call in my life to preach the gospel. Ended up, you know, going through all this stuff, getting to a point. We ended up going to Montana to help uh, start a set free, and it didn't work out very well. So we came back, and then one day, some of you guys will remember this guy, uh, Dr. Drake. You guys remember him? Yeah, I mean, he hasn't been gone that long. <laughs> um, I walked into church one day, and he's sitting in the front row, and his church shirt said Northeast Florida Baptist Association. And I knew, my wife and I both knew right then, we're going to Florida. So I walked in, told, told the pastor, I said, hey, we're going to Florida. It's like, whoa, whoa, slow down, bro. Slow down. I, I tend to get excited, and, and he just says, slow down. And then I ended up coming out here. Uh, February or January 2013, and I've been out here ever since. We came to plant set free. We came to, to come in and, and do what God had done in our lives for other people. And it brings me to what set free is truly about. <clears throat> I know we're a little spot off on 17. Um, I looked at the numbers today. We've had 1,980 men come through there over the last 10 years. And it, it's, it's awesome. I got a few of them with me today. Um, but what is Set Free really about? Is it just an addiction ministry? No. No. Most of us there have struck, have The story that I told you about my life is James' story, Mark's story, Daniel's story. A few of the little things change, but it, our stories are all the same. We... Uh, we're lost. We were dead in trespass and sin until God did something. Nothing changed. Amen. Nothing changed. The first goal of set free, the, our first mission is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. To preach the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. To preach faith in Christ. Because it doesn't do me any good for people to get sober and not get saved. If people don't know the Lord, then all they are are sober. And, 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 and sober is good while we're here, but sober doesn't do anything for us for eternity. And, and so the first, first goal is we are a church, and, and our first mission as a church is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. If it wasn't for Christ, I'd be dead or in prison right now. And I have no, it, no doubts about it because the track that I was on was not a pretty track. <clears throat> And our mission is to seek those who are lost in sinful desires and lifestyles and, and to share Jesus to them. And what that means is we go places that a lot of churches won't go. We are looking at, at, at trying to get a building right now. And the building that we're trying to acquire is, on, is right off of Edgewood and Lem Turner. Um, I don't know if you guys know Jacksonville, but that's not a place that most people want to be at night. That's where we want to be. That I, I saw the neighborhood, I saw the building, and my heart jumped because that's where we need to be. We need to be in the hood. We need to be where, where there's prostitutes and there's drug addicts, that there's hustlers on the corner, that there's people robbing and stuff. That's where we want to be. That's, those are the people that we generally minister to. And we want to go share Jesus with them. We want to go share hope with them. We want to... to Share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And then we also want to disciple believers in their relationship with Christ. To bring about the obedience of faith. Um, Romans is kind of cool. Romans is one of my favorite books. It starts off with the obedience of faith. And it ends with the obedience of faith in, in the middle is how you get there. But that's our goal. The heartbeat of Set Free is our live-in discipleship ministry where 
there's about 50 guys right now. We're, our numbers are kind of low. There's normally about 60 to 70. Um, I don't know why. We just had a max, mass exodus. But that's not the whole of Set Free. Set Free is a church. We're a church that have traditional worship services. They're a little bit different, I guess, you know. Um, we do community outreach. We like to go set up and go share the gospel in, in some dark places. But the heartbeat is to live in discipleship ministry. And you, where we are right now, California is different. Everywhere is different. But Nehana has one, and we're here. Um, the first phase is five months. And in those five months, they hear the gospel repeatedly. Um, they're in seven, six to seven Bible studies every day, starting at 6.30 in the morning. The last one's at 6.30 at night. And for three months, they are in those classrooms. They don't leave. They don't, they don't go anywhere. We have church on Tuesdays and church on Sundays. We, but they are in there for that time. So they get saturated with the Word of God. We have a Bible reading um, time to where they, they're, just, they're in there and they read. And in 90 days, I think they go through about twice. So they get the entire Bible in their first part. After that, they start helping in the community. We send them on what's called work blessings because our ministry is completely free. We don't want to charge anybody. We don't want to take anybody's money. Um, we want people to, to get help. I know when I was at the darkest part of my life and I, um, I was told that I had to get sober for two weeks and then pay all kinds of money. I was like, dude, if I could get sober, I wouldn't be calling you right now. If I could do any of this, I would not be calling you right now. If I had any money, I wouldn't spend it on rehab. So we want to take out everything. What, what people need is just a desire to be there. They don't need clothes. They don't need any of that. If, if they walked in with nothing, we have everything for them. But then they give back. They go on work blessings. They work in the community and the community donates to the ministry. Or they'll go work jobs and the jobs will pay us like they're paying an employee to give back. That, that, that's the way that we do it is we receive and then we give back. We receive the blessings and, and, and what every, the people in front of us have paid for with their work. We then pay for the next guy to come. After the five months, they can go into phase two, and in phase two, they can get a job. They can get their phone, um, and the idea is for them to start, you know, catch up on their child support, to uh, pay fines, get, get everything, get all their court stuff situated, maybe get their driver's license back. And then before they, I, I think it's a good idea for the guys to not leave for at least a year, that they, they, they go through the, the process, and if we got guys that are two years, three years, six years, the time frame doesn't matter as long as you're doing what you're, what you're supposed to do. I've seen guys get their, life, their wives back, their kids back, get their driver's license back, get all their court stuff taken care of, and have a whole fresh start all over again. And then when they move out, the first thing I tell them is, where are you going to go to church? Find a church. I tell them, if you can't make it to set free, which to me is kind of weird, you know, we had a guy, he moved out and he drove past set free five days, five, six days a week to go to work, but wouldn't come to church. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it's too far. It's not too far for work, but it's too far for church. That's strange. You know, people will, we will relocate for a job, but we're not going we're not going to drive 10, 15 minutes to go to church because that's, that's just crazy. Looking forward, you know, right now we're kind of a homeless ministry. We don't have our own building to worship in. We don't, you know, so we're looking to, to acquire that. Um, our vision, my vision for the future, what God has kind of placed on my heart hasn't really changed, but a worship center that Actually, this size is awesome. Um, not coveting your church, but, you know, this is, this is a good size. 
250 people, give or take, you know, that's a good size. Because we run about 140 with the guys and, and their families and some people that come back. 120 to 140 people in the church were pretty good. And then after that, because we've been here for 10 years and we've had a men, men's ministry this whole time. We've gone to start a women's ministry and then it fell apart and, and we did it again. We tried and then the, the leader ended up going back to Wyoming because her mom was sick and, and her mom ended up passing away. So she's out in, in Wyoming right now doing uh, the women's ministry out there. So we want to have a, a women's ministry. We're not going to, I don't want to hold 70 women, just like 25, probably pretty good. Um, and then we want to move forward and, and get a phase two home for the men and a phase two home for women. And then train pastors to go and plant more. Send some guys out to plant more set frees. So that's my story and set free kind of in a nutshell. Um, I got to share this though too because the timing of here is, is so we're, we're looking at a building but we're short on money so we're having a fundraiser. So I have a flyer for our fundraiser, <laughs> of course. Um, it's a variety show that we're having. Um, I think Keith Foskey's been here before, right? He, he preaches here sometimes. Uh, they're hosting a, our fundraiser. We're having a variety show. <laughs> um, Stand-up comedy, magic act, an accordion player, a ventriloquist, and a couple other things. A spoken word guy that does spoken word rap stuff, um, shrimp tacos, chicken tacos, the whole nine yards. So we'll have flyers um, at the end of this. We'll be back at the door. Um, let's turn to Matthew 11. I want to share one of my favorite passages. I still hear pages turning, so I'll wait. It's a, when you're a pastor, that's like the most beautiful sound ever, is when you say something and you hear. It doesn't happen a lot at my church. <laughs> we got to quit putting it on the screen so we make them turn their Bibles. <clears throat> Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, it says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At this time, man, when Jesus spoke these words, he spoke these words to Pharisees. The people that were, were burdened down by the law. They were burdened down by all this stuff going on. You know, uh, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you have no place in the kingdom of heaven. And, and, and he's talking to people that are broken and, and they're sinners and they're, they're oppressed because they're looking at the Pharisees saying, I can never do this. I can never be good enough. And that's, that's kind of where, where I come from in my life is I looked at church and I was like, I never deserve to be there. I cannot clean my life up enough to be there. I can't obey enough in order to earn my place into this. And Jesus said, you know, these people burdened by the law and, and the heavy weights that the Pharisees put in, these heavy weights that, that are, are, are just burdens. And Jesus says, come to me. All you who are working, you're, you're trying so hard to get yourself right. You're trying so hard to be right before God. You're trying so hard, but your efforts don't really do it. Because no matter how good we are, our best works are tainted by sin. Anytime a person gets a hold of something, it can be sinful. I can destroy anything quick because I'm a sinner. I'm selfish. I'm, and I'm, a lot of times, I'm a sinner. All the time, I'm a sinner. A lot of times, it's apparent. 
And I tried so many years and so long trying to make myself right to be accepted by God. And I cannot make myself accepted by God. There's nothing that the Pharisees or the, the Israelites could do. There's nothing that you can do to make yourself right before God. But in Christ, we receive the righteousness. In Christ, we have all the fullness of God. Amen. And we are righteous because we are united to Christ by faith. It says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I know that we, are, we, we struggle so much sometimes, and sometimes we get so caught up in, in making sure everything is right, making sure this, making sure that, that we, well, maybe it's just me. I'm not going to put this on you guys. But I know for myself that I try to be so good so much that it wears my soul out, it wears my heart out, wears my body out to where I know what's going on inside of my heart. And I feel like a hypocrite. I feel like every, everything I put out is not what's really going on. And I get tired. I get tired of, of the struggle and trying to be perfect. That's a heavy burden. That's a heavy weight trying to be perfect. We can't be perfect. But Jesus is perfect. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, as I've read through, you know, I, I read a lot. I read through the word and, and there's something dawned on me a long time ago. I say a long time ago, a couple years ago. Is that Jesus' harshest words are for those putting burdens on people. Jesus' words for the broken are very gentle, or very soft. Come to me, all you who are who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Coming from where we come from, we know that we can't be perfect in this. We know that we cannot attain all these things. We know that we cannot hold on to all these things. We know that we can't get right. But I'm so thankful that Jesus did it for us. So thankful that I'm judged by works, but not mine. Because if I'm, my salvation was rested upon me, 0.00001%, I'm lost. Jesus did it all. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I want to thank you for this time. Lord, I want to thank you for uh, for Greg Abel's. Lord, I want to thank you for their hearts here, Lord. I want to thank you for the work that you have done here, Lord, that you continue to do here, Lord. I want to th thank you for all those that are, that are here, Lord, that are, are listening, Lord. I, but I also want to, want to pray right now for those, for the one that might not know you, Lord. The one that might be struggling, Lord. The one that might uh, just be uncertain of whether or not they're really saved, Lord, or uncertain of where they stand or uncertain of whether they're worthy of this, Lord. I pray for them. Lord, I pray that, that you uh, draw them to yourself, Lord, that you um, give them life, Lord, that you give them new life, Lord. I pray for this congregation, Lord. I pray that, that you help them to rest in you, Lord, that you help them to, to just know that you are enough, Lord. That you are enough, Lord. That there's nothing else that needs to be added to you or taken away from you, Lord. But that you are enough. That you are enough for their life, Lord. That you are enough for what they're going through today, Lord. That you are enough for their sons. 
You're enough for their daughters, Lord. That you're enough for their parents and their brothers and sisters, Lord. That you're enough for their community. But that you're enough for those that are broken by their sin. Lord, when I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. But when we look to you, I don't see how I could be lost. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.